So yeah, I guess we're going to kind of just jump right into things. Um, I mean, I, I basically spent the whole first lecture going over the syllabus and, and talking about um, why nations fail. Okay, so you should um, either purchase why nations fail or go through PitCat, um, uh, whatever whatever suits you best, um, and start reading it. Uh, you know, we're going to have on the 19th, which is a week from today, uh, talking about... Um, the preface in chapters one through four. We might actually, I might, you should read it by then, but I'm, I might uh, postpone the discussion until the next class because that's going to be our first in-person class. And it's just a lot easier to uh, do class discussions in person than on uh, a remote video, um, as I'm sure you are all aware. Uh, okay, so, um, but yeah, so let's get started here. All right, so with the, the basically the first thing I'm going to do is give you um, a little bit of an overview, like of of the basically the broad historical facts that I want to uh, kind of emphasize and and use as a little bit of a foundation for what we talk about in the course. Okay, and it's going to be I mean most of the stuff I'm going to say today in the general sense. I mean you're going to be aware of sort of like obvious you know the, the growth has has been going on in the world for quite a while. Technological growth, um, economic growth. It's it's uh sort of took off with the industrial revolution. In the 20th century, there's a lot of inequality, disparities between different countries. We all know that. Okay, so I'm going to provide a little bit more detail on that and show you sort of how we can think about and measure that systematically. Okay, um, and then we're going to use that as sort of motivation for for stepping into this Malthusian framework. Okay, so and uh, I think I said last time, you know, it's not, it's not it's kind of related to what Malthus actually said, um, except it's framed a little bit more in terms of modern economic terms and, and uh, notation and things like that. But it's actually a relatively simple model that will give you a little bit of um, sort of uh, a good starting point, I think, um, for what we move on to uh, after that. OK, so let's do it. Um, yeah, all right, so these are the slides. Um, if, uh, if, they, if they look. On the video here, if they, if they look like weird and pixelated, I, I, I think last year I had some issues with that, but it may have been fixed in Zoom. Um, if that is the case, then just let me know. I can I can try and fix that. Okay. Um, I know that I in the corner look weird and pixelated um, because I don't know the the, the green screen isn't really up to stuff, but um, you should be able to at least see see through mostly. Okay. So um, all right. So the first lecture, historical growth. Okay. Um, twenty twenty. It's not twenty twenty anymore. That's an, that's an homage to 2020 being the year that never ends. Okay, so, uh, but I really should uh, update that uh, number there. Okay, so um, let's go. All right, so we're gonna do some history. All right, um, don't tell the historians. Uh, so basically, uh, here, here are the kind of long run facts that I wanna to, to talk about, okay? Um, essentially, uh, I'm gonna break things into to two or three, I guess, uh, broad periods. Okay. So essentially, um, if you go back a really long time, uh, in terms, you know, at least in human terms, um, about 10,000 years ago, basically everyone was poor by modern standards. Okay. And by poor, I mean, their standard of living was low. You know, uh, if, if you were to live like that in the modern world, you probably wouldn't be happy, uh, in a lot of ways. Okay. So, um, and that's, based on, you know, you can frame it in more concrete terms in terms of like nutrition, the variety of food available, um, uh, the health outcomes, all right, uh, disease outcomes, those are all like really bad by modern standards, okay? Um, and then of course, entertainment, I don't, I actually don't know, a hun I mean, people entertain themselves, of course, but I think we, we have a much larger variety of different types of entertainment today, so, so that's a thing. Um, yeah, so, so it's pretty bad. Um, and that kind of persisted for a really long time. Okay, so it wasn't like, you know, this, uh, I would say, some people say linear, uh, I want to say like monotone process where um, you start out here and you just slowly build up to the modern level standard of living. It was even, even if you look at it in log space, it, it was merely more like a long period of stagnation and then this takeoff. Okay, so, and that takeoff, um, is basically associated with the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, a big, rapid uh, improvements in technology. Okay, um, 
But, you know, before 1800, you know, so you, you go far back, things are bad. Before 1800, basically, the, you know, there was some improvements up until 1800. Okay, you know, people discovered things, uh, uh, um, scientific things and stuff like that. Um, so there were some improvements. Um, and obviously, uh, politically, uh, you know, things evolved, you know, uh, you got started getting more centralization, like after the move to agriculture, you get more centralization, city states, states, uh, empires and all of that, which good for some people, bad for other people, you know, um, but but there was definitely sort of advanced and more sophisticated societies you know, showing up. But in terms of the living standards, still didn't change that much. And countries were relatively similar, because they just had these, you know, basic types of technology that they were operating. And that's sort of the best you could do. Okay. Um, and then, you know, enlightenment and industrial revolution come along and that's where things truly do change sort of, uh, substantively. Um, and so you see a lot of countries start to grow really rapidly. Um, and that sort of percolates through, you know, kind of starts in England and, and, and Western Europe and percolates, uh, in that area and to some extent around the world. Okay. But it definitely doesn't happen evenly. Okay. And so as a result of this, rapid growth in certain regions and then sort of not so rapid growth in other regions, you get these growing disparities. Okay. So the other regions still grow. They just didn't grow as fast. Um, and so that's why you see these big disparities. Okay. Um, now in terms of data, all right, obviously it's hard to get data. We don't have GDP data for the year 10,000. It's like, you know, at, at some point it, it becomes hard to say like, what are you even talking about? Because, you know, the countries, you know, we usually group, uh, data by say countries at the international level but the countries don't exist. You just say, okay, that region. Okay. Um, but of course we, we just don't have that data. Okay. So, um, the, there's some attempts to kind of, uh, do as, as well as we can and get somewhat systematic data. Okay. On countries or like the regions that are currently constitute modern day, uh, country boundaries. Um, and, and it's really tough, but you know, there's this Madison project and they have, they have attempted to do that. And so there, you know, you're, um, you know, it, it's, they're, they're trying to map into some notion of GDP per capita. Okay. And so I won't go into the full details of how they do that, but basically, you know, you don't, you know, you can't just say, okay, uh, what did the statistical agency report in Greece for GDP at the time? Cause they didn't even invent the concept, right? So you need to look at what people are consuming. Okay. So they're consuming X amount of grains uh water things like that um and say okay this is this is the basket of goods that they're consuming okay and then you need to get some prices to try and turn that into gdp okay but then the question of course is well, which prices do you use okay you could use like modern day prices and say okay well this is how much we this is how much grain costs today multiply that by how much grain they consumed that's their like gdp okay um that's one way but also you know, different countries have different prices for different goods, right? So then it's like, well, which country do we use? Uh, which time period do we use and so on? So um, that makes things a little difficult. Okay, so, but but there are ways to try and um, come up with sort of a rigorous method of, of, of accounting for all of this, okay? None of them are perfect, of course, and the data is really noisy, but there are ways, okay? Um, yeah. So, 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 but, but there's a lot of details there that I'm not going to talk about, at least right now. Maybe I'll talk about them later on, uh, that go into the, the data construction because it's very non-obvious. Okay. Even for modern day GDP, it's very non-obvious because you have things like, um, people that own their own homes, you know, they don't, their enjoyment of that home does not show up as a transaction because they're like, the well, you can think about it as you're renting it to yourself, right? So imagine someone was, I'm kind of, getting off on a tangent here, but imagine someone was living, uh, renting a house and then they bought it and moved into it. If you just looked at like economic transactions occurring, you'd see, you know, rental payment, rental payment, rental payment, that's GDP and then nothing. And, and so the, the naive interpretation, the naive reading would say, oh, well, GDP went down by that amount. Right. But of course nothing really changed. It's just a, a change of ownership. Uh, so you can say, well, they're renting to themselves. And then you kind of come up with the uh, a number for what the rent would have been and use that. Okay. So, so even with modern day GDP, there's, there's difficult and tough questions to ask. Now we go back even farther. These even more difficult questions. Okay. But take it with a huge grain of salt, all these numbers then, right? So that's, that's all I'm saying. Um, so those guys, the, the Madison project, uh, I, I think I linked 
I link to it on the, the website, or if I don't, I will, um, that they have basically just a big Excel spreadsheet of all this data. So it goes back to like the year one, okay, um, and then onwards, and it's it's like not every year, it's like sort of spotty um, in the in the interim periods, uh, and then gets a little better around 1820 and, and onwards, okay? Um, and they have both countries and regions of the world, okay? And then uh, and then once you hit 1950 though, then this, uh, there's this other thing called the Penn World Tables, um, which is like, you know, just focuses on the modern era after 1950, um, when we get much better data and compiles that. And in addition to GDP per capita, they have a bunch of other things like um, trade, you know, exports, imports, uh, labor, capital income, profits, and all of that. Okay. So we can look at that too. All right. So then well, let's just get an idea of like what these numbers are. Okay. So uh, here's here's just a sort of a sampling of certain countries. Okay, um, I think yeah. What, so what I did here, I just looked at all the countries that have um, data in the year one. So this is these are the set of countries that actually do have data in the year one, uh, and then looked at their actual GDP per capita or per population, the, the, the header there um, in year one, and then the same countries GDP per capita in 1950. Okay, um, and so. Yeah, so the first thing is that the you know what I was saying before is that um, the standard of living didn't differ too terribly much you know between all of these countries. I guess Italy and Greece are especially Italy is a little bit of a standout, but like they're all pretty much around a thousand, and then Italy and Greece are a little bit higher, right? So, um, but they didn't differ too much. Okay, obviously, also these aren't all the countries that existed or uh, polities or whatever you want to at that at that stage. Um, they're not all that existed. It's just the ones that we have data for. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it's largely um, some of Europe and the Middle East, I guess. That's it. Right. So, um, <clears throat> in, yeah, North Africa. So, uh, yeah, so basically around the Mediterranean. Okay. So you can, and so you, and then the other thing to see is, well, there are, have been changes going from year one to 1950. Okay. Um, but then the, you know, first of all, the the order changes. Okay, so like Switzerland goes from being near the, the bottom to like really very good. Okay, um, England isn't on here, so I guess we can't talk about them. But um, yeah, but then uh, if you know if you look at a country like uh, you know Iran and Iraq haven't moved that much, and they've definitely gone down in the the relative rankings. Same with Greece. Okay, um, haven't uh, you know started near the top. And ends up, you know, not too close to the top in 1950. Okay, so there's reordering of things. Different countries do better or worse, and so on. Okay, and um, you know, you can tell stories about why that is, right? So maybe for Greece, they were, you know, they're on the Mediterranean. Um, trade, you know, Mediterranean trade is extremely important. That's kind of the center of uh, one of the economic centers of the world at that point. But then as you go farther forward in 1950, you know, just shipping being a, a trade hub. Things like that uh, maybe are relatively less important. Other things, types of resources or, or talents are important, and so that's could be a story. Okay, and then there's also political factors that can always uh, intervene as well. Okay, um, the next thing we can do is is look at some graphs for for particular countries. Okay, so here I'm just using um, England, Iraq, and Turkey. All right, so th these are like the three-digit country codes, ISO codes, but this Great Britain, basically, I'm gonna say England, uh, I guess it's England and Scotland. Um, although, I don't know when that, that whole thing went, when the, the union went down, maybe it was around here, uh, and then Iraq and Turkey. Okay, so um, I guess that, you know, you can see, well, first of all, England, the, the data doesn't go back that far. Well, it goes back to the year 1000, which is pretty good. Um, I think that it doesn't change that much in this region, probably sort of a, a steady uh, increase over this zero to a thousand period, so-called dark ages. Okay, so, um, but, you know, England at, in this region was kind of a backwater of the world, right? They, they weren't very important. Uh, okay, so, um, but then I guess my takeaway on this graph, all right, is, well, there's kind of an interesting little blip here uh, in the middle for Iraq, right? So there is the, the, you know, the rise of Islam and the, the Muslim world. And that was a, a period of, of, you know, great like mathematical and scientific and engineering achievement, you know, sort of a lot of it was happening in, in Baghdad, right? So that was like a really important city. 
and you could see that's kind of when things peak around 750 uh into a thousand i believe is, is sort of when the the baghdad was was in sort of the muslim world was doing really well okay and then they kind of go back down right um that subsides uh and then turkey just kind of doing their thing right um and then england you can see sort of kind of middle of the pack starting out in the year a thousand and then some perhaps nascent improvements are happening right so but it's not really clear that that, that anything you can make anything of that but there are some sort of you know improvements you know proportionally you know 750 you know uh 75 percent almost 100 percent uh increase in in gdp per capita okay so that's sort of like pre-enlightenment okay so there there's a a question of like you know for england where the industrial revolution started you know what why was that okay and some of that we're going to touch on in why nations fail okay because that's a that's kind of critical to part of the what they're talking about is like explaining differential outcomes between different countries is okay well why did the industrial revolution happen in england was it because like they had some you know sort of uh primitive type of patent system uh that encouraged innovation and and hence um, that set the stage for inventors to, to do their thing and create new technologies and spark the industrial revolution, right? Was it something else? So, so that's sort of a major, um, question of why it happened there. So we, we will talk about that. I don't think there's a hundred percent definitive answer on that. Um, but part of it is also, you know, with, with the enlightenment, okay. Sort of, um, you know, you, that also happened in Europe, and you might think that this sort of also relates to the story, and and maybe, you know, there's this sort of like dynamic where you know um, the advancements in sci science say uh, lead to advancements uh, in econ in technology and and hence economic outcomes, but then also you know having good economic outcomes may lead to advances in science, right? Because like you know all the guys in England, I, I mean many of most of them were men at, at the time. Uh, you know, just because of the way the society functioned, um, you know, the, it was, you know, if you think about like a stereotypical person there, it was like a Lord who basically didn't do anything but like hunt and run experiments in their lab. Right. So you might think that having a good, good economic outcomes, at least for some people, you know, you just have more free time. You can, you have more ability and time to undertake scientific research. Okay. And you have more stability, maybe politically uh, to, to reap the benefits of that. Okay, so then you, there's probably sort of like this recursive two-way dynamic between economic outcomes and like technological outcomes, okay? And you can say the same thing with political outcomes, okay? So so maybe you can see that's the beginning of this, perhaps, all right? But, you know, we're going to say, okay, so, so first of all, the, the two sides of this are plotting the same thing, okay? Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're plotting um, the, uh, hold on one second here. Let's fix one thing. Okay. Um, the two sides of this are plotting the same thing. So they're both plotting GDP per capita for Great Britain uh, and uh, Iraq and Turkey. All right. And I'm, the only thing that's changing is one is before 1600 and the other is after 1600. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, well, the other thing that's changing is the scale. Okay. So the scale is radically different on the right. Uh, oh, Joshua, you, you got a question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, definitely, definitely the first one. Yeah. So the the um, I, I, what I should really do is have little points where there actually is data. So I'm basically sort of just like drawing lines between where there are data points. And you know, for for Turkey. I would bet it's basically there's data at one and there's data at 750 and like they're approximately the same, you know? Um, but yeah, it's not like it was exactly applied here. So don't read, yeah, don't read too much into this fuzziness and, and variation here. It's just that you have more frequent data there. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, um, well, okay, so so I think in terms of the variability, um, it's hard to yeah. Looking looking at the right one, you it, you I I, I mean, you you would really want to plot it like in in uh, logs and then kind of look at it more closely, and, and we may be able to do that in in a later graph, but um, uh, so there's well, okay, so there's there's a couple of things. One is that um, even for the right graph, okay, where we have more frequent data, um. It it might be that uh, the just the the quality of the data is not as good as you go farther back, and they're just like, um, you know, they're 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 doing more kind of approximations. Okay, so like you know, if you if you look at Turkey over here, it's like basically that what's happening is that the the measurement is just really noisy. Okay, but but the way that manifests is basically like they're just like oh, it's around nine hundred here, and it's around nine hundred here. Okay, so there's obviously like a lot of guesswork going on for these early numbers. And so it, it looks like it's very stable, but in fact, it probably is much more unstable because there's, uh, you know, uh, natural disasters, blights, political upheaval, and everything like that are going to be more common the farther you go back, right? So so I would kind of, my guess would be, and, and I guess we could, I don't know if we're going to see it today um but but maybe next lecture i can i can transform this and we can try and get a good read on that there's actually ways you can measure it in the, the variance like over time too um i would bet though that the variance goes up as you go farther back um because uh yeah just this political instability is is greater and and it's um you know uh markets can be more volatile especially if you think about um communication right so the like as communication gets better over the course of history, markets presumably get less volatile because it's like, you know, like, like even if you have like a telegraph, you know, you can figure out, okay, what's the price of grain over in this uh, nearby state or county or whatever. Um, and and uh, if you want to sell there, you know, you can do so with with more confidence that it'll actually sell at a reasonable price, right? So, you you know, stuff like information technology, even in the, in the relatively primitive forms like a telegraph, do, do stabilize things too. And then as you get farther in the future, uh, as technology progresses, you should see more of that, right? So so I bet if we had perfect data, we we would probably see the reduction in variance over time. Yeah, you definitely do see that in the US, like in the modern era, uh, going into the sort of the 90s and 2000s, before 2008, of course, uh, you do see a reduction in variance like that too. And then 2008 kind of throws that off. But um, yeah, so but that but that's a really interesting question. And I think the only problem is that um, it might be that just the data gets worse as you go back and it just sort of artificially looks more stable than it is. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep, cool. Um, all right, so so yeah, so then, yeah, so on the right side, okay, so, you know, after 1600, scales change radically. So basically everything that's happening in the left side is, you know, basically between zero and 2000. So that would be between, you know, well, it's basically where that blue line is, right? So everything is happening uh, uh, in this really very small area down here. And then sort of the whole, you know, like basically kind of this, I don't know if there's an inflection. I mean, basically like 1800, like right around here, things start taking off. Okay. So it's it's a little tricky and I'm kind of, kind of gaming us to, to make it look more eye popping than maybe it is. But like, you know, because anytime you look at an exponential like this, it's always going to look like kind of nothing is happening and then things explode, right? So because this area is compressed, but even if you plot it um, in logs, which takes care of that issue, which is I'm, I'm sure you get, you know, just people talking and look, talking about COVID numbers and looking at COVID numbers, the same kind of issue comes up is, you know, by plotting in the logs, you can get a little bit of a better sense because in, in logs, an exponential process will look linear. And if it, if it speeds up, it'll look linear and then have, you know, like a change in slope. Okay, so we'll, t we'll talk about that um, and how you can kind of, you know, just, just uh, techniques for visualizing GDP data and, and economic data in general, um, but but that's one thing. Okay, but but undeniably though, you know, there's a lot of rapid growth going on here, okay? And it's different across different countries, right? So I chose these partially because they have different types of outcomes. Okay, so if you look at England, right? Well, we know what happens, I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of technological change, a stable, well, not kind of stable political system through there are various uh, twists and turns, and and um, they they did quite well, all right. Um, and then it, so if you look at uh, I guess like, like Turkey, you know, sort of um, stagnating 
for a long time in the Ottoman era. It's a lot of stagnation. Okay. Um, and then uh, you do see a rapid run up eventually. Okay. Which is kind of coincides with the, uh, what is it? Um, like Ataturk and the whole new era in, in Turkey. Right. But it's, it's quite delayed compared to England. And as a kind of, as a result, you know, they, they, you know, the end, the end point is about half of what England is. Okay. Um, and then uh, Iraq, you know, they also they have the issue of like really major wars and political instability, right? So here in Iraq, so so I think, you know, this it's not like the, the GDP went up discontinuously in 1950. I think that's another artifact of the measurement process, but let's imagine this is a little smoother. You know, they're doing quite well up until around 1980. Okay, but that's when the Iran-Iraq war happens. Um, you know, these two neighboring countries go to war, and so that's just has a kind of catastrophic effect on their um, economic output um, and well-being in general. And then they, they start going back up again. And then, you know, sort of the Iraq war base happens and and, and that uh, that whole thing, right? So um, Iraq war, both one and two, right? So um, that's a case where political instability has a really large influence on, on what's going on there uh, in wars. Um, and so it's a complicated story, right? So, um, yeah. All right. So then we can, instead of just looking at three kind of random countries, we can also look at um, regions of the world. All right. Um, so we have, well, we don't have every region in the world, but I think we have a good sampling of them. All right. So we have, uh, I threw in the USA as a region, just as like, we're in the US, why not? Um, that's in light blue. So that, so basically we have Western Europe, in uh, dark blue, with uh, East Asia in red, um, Sub-Saharan Africa in green, Latin America in purple, and Middle East in yellow. All right, so um, I guess I don't know. I mean, th this. So first of all, this is this is since 1820, which is when the medicine data starts um, becoming more frequent. All right, and it probably ho hopefully better. Um, and here I'm also plotting in logs. Okay, so that's what I was alluding to in the last slide. So here, because we're plotting in logs, you know. It's, you know, if we plot it in um, just regular, absolute, you know, normal values, you know, it would look the same as last slide, which is sort of this, this classic exponential curve, at least for uh, the regions that are growing rapidly, okay? But if we plot it in the logs, you know, it, it's a little bit, it can be deceptive in two ways, because, you know, if you plot it in the logs, it might look kind of underwhelming. It's like, oh, you just kind of went up. But in absolute terms, you know, these are really big changes since 1820 to 2000, the, the growth has been you know, astronomical. Okay. But by plotting on logs, we can, you know, that gives you a better idea of sort of the growth rate, uh, over time and whether that's changed. Okay. Um, and, and essentially this is something we're going to talk about probably at the end of this lecture is if you have an exponentially growing process or series of data and you plot, you know, time on the x-axis and the log of that, uh, series on the y-axis, if it's growing exponentially, it's just going to be a straight line. Okay. And if it's a growing, if it's growing approximately exponentially, it's going to be, you know, a straight line plus some noise. Okay. So that's kind of like what you see for, for the U S right here. Um, that's what you kind of see here. And, and so, um, it's, it's less deceptive, right? Cause you can see like, if it's a constantly growing, you know, if you're growing 2% every year, right. Basically the slope of this is going to be 2%. It's going to be 0 0.02. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, and that's why, uh, you know, on the left here, we have, you know, 10 to the three, it's like a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand. This is a logarithmic scale. Okay. Um, and so, well, I'll start with the U S and then we can go to the other. So for the U S you know, it, the, the, to a first order, it's just a straight line plus some noise, right? Now you can try and tell stories about the, the slope of the line changing over time, but it's sort of like here, it, it's an issue of kind of like a, a low signal to noise situation because, you know, maybe the slope changed, but maybe it's just a, the noise happened to make it look like that. Okay. And you can do more rigorous statistical tests to try and tease that out, but like just eyeballing it, it's, it's a little hard to tell, but, but one thing, I mean, I think it's clear that this is important. So basically this is the combination of the great depression causing a massive, you know, 1930, 29 massive drop in uh, output and then some slow recovery. And then basically world war two happens. And for the U S it's, I mean, it's tough, right? But, but it, there's a, the actual, if you just like production, it, it goes way up, right? Because we're not being invaded 
um, but we are producing a ton of build tier equipment and selling that to other people, right? So in terms of GDP, that actually looks pretty good, right? Um, so that's why you see this, not just recovery from the Great Depression, but it actually, actually a pretty large increase. Then you return to normal after that, right? So um, that, you know, aside from that, you know, it's basically a straight line. And then, so you could say like here, you know, in this era, pre-Depression era, there was some growth rate. Maybe it's a little higher post-World War II, but maybe that's just an artifact of like getting out of the Depression with a huge war, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, then there's the question of, does the slope decrease at the end here? Yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of it does, right? And this actually, this goes up to, yeah, that's a, that, that thing at the very end is the Great Recession, right? So you can say like, it's definitely not the Great Depression, right? The Great Depression was massive. Um, uh, the Great Depression was quite large and bad in a lot of ways, but like you can see just from, from this graph that it, it wasn't... Um, quite as big, all right? But you can also see that the recovery has been pretty kind of anemic, right? So um, you don't see a return to exactly the same growth rate. And, and even if you look sort of since the, the mid 80s to 90 and, and beyond the, the growth rate, it's a little slower than it was, okay? And um, that could be a bunch of things. It might, it might not even be anything to do with policy per se, right? Uh, it could just be that post-World War II, there was a massive uh, technological revolution, kind of semiconductors and information technology, uh, aircraft, all of that, right? So, um, and spacecraft and everything. Um, not to mention, like, all of that percolating into more consumer-oriented goods. So you get, like, radar, GPS, and all of that, right? So, um, and and some of that really was, like, just, like, came from doing World War II, right? Even though World War II was bad and it killed a lot of people. Uh, some of that you, know, you can trace back to developments that occurred at that time. So, so part of it might just be that there was this massive technological revolution and like that can't go on forever. And you eventually go back to kind of like normal technological growth where we're just like, you know, making different apps and stuff like that. Right. Which is great. You know, it, it, it's good, but um, maybe it just doesn't produce that same kick in terms of uh, GDP. Okay. Um, all right. So that's the US. All right. Uh, we'll talk more about that. You can look at Western Europe. So Western Europe is going to look relatively similar to the U.S. I mean, these, these are countries that are in close contact, um, trade frequently with each other, technological uh, exchanges occur uh, often. Um, so, you, so you'd expect them to be relatively close. There always is kind of a gap between the U.S. and Western Europe in terms of GDP, even if this, the slopes kind of mirror each other. Um, we'll get into that. I mean, it's... Uh, there are probably a bunch of reasons for that, some of which might be kind of like a measurement error story, but but others of it are, you know, maybe it's just, um, you know, if, if you if you work less, right, uh, you're going to produce less, but you'll have more leisure time, you can go on vacation more, right? So, uh, you know, if, if Western European countries just value leisure more, say, or are able to take more leisure time, um, that, that would show up as lower GDP, higher leisure, right? But if you thought about a more general notion of welfare, maybe that that's not bad, right? Um, that's just the way things are. Uh, and we'll talk about that. So that's like this Beyond GDP paper that I talked about last time. That's exactly what they do is try to incorporate more factors beyond GDP to give you a some some notion that's closer to a, a, a notion of welfare, of, of utility and welfare, right? So um, yeah. So and then so, so that's one thing is just the, the gap between Western Europe and, and uh, the US. The other thing is, you know, there basically here and here, well, were those it's World War I and World War II. So the U.S. was not uh, invaded or substantially destroyed in any way domestically, um, directly uh, in either of those wars, right? So uh, whereas Europe was, okay? So that's why you see that, these, these sort of reductions here in World War I and II. But they bounced back, you know? So, um, okay, so the rest of the world, very important. Um, Let's see. So I guess, I mean, so Latin America, let's just go, in, let's go in here. So in, 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 or these lines, um, Latin America, I mean, they do, there is a, a gap between Latin America and Europe, right? They have sort of consistent growth, maybe a little tapering off at the edge here, but um, at the end there, uh, but you know, relatively consistent growth. Um, and then if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, the Middle East. Okay, so here you have a lot of stagnation until like 1920, and then you have pretty rapid growth. Okay, um, since then, right? So, uh, 
and that, now they're kind of at a similar point to East Asia and Latin America, all right? Um, and, and this is the case where you, you really do see a discrete change in the growth rate after like 1920, right, up, up to there, okay? So you know, part of that is gonna be driven by um, oil, basically the discovery of oil reserves. I, I forget exactly when, because uh, oil, you know, is discovered, uh, oil that you can drill out of the ground en masse and sell was discovered in you know here in Western Pennsylvania first. Uh, maybe there was some in like Azerbaijan, but basically it happened in Western Pennsylvania first. Okay, um, and but then they discovered it in a bunch of other places and so on. So, uh, but I, I think that maybe this change here is going to be related to that, uh, probably. Okay, uh, and then if you look at East Asia, um, the uh, basically not much happening until 1950. And then there's this huge takeoff. Okay, so, you know, basically this is, again, you can see here this big dip um, from World War II, right? Because uh, East Asia was kind of devastated in a lot of ways by um, the the Japanese expansion and the various battles that went on there. Okay, and then after that, Japan included, you have this huge um, uh, uh, amount of growth going on. And, it, and it's very clear change in the, the slope there of, of the growth rates. And, and you can see by the end, they basically um, surpass Latin America and on a par with the, the Middle East. Okay, so, um, and then Sub-Saharan Africa, like kind of not much going on here and then slowly kind of a takeoff in growth, which is kind of suffers a lot in kind of the, I guess this would be the eighties and nineties, okay. So I think, um, I mean, there, there's a lot of political instability uh, in certain countries. You know, AIDS was 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 really bad. Okay, and that's not, I mean, just in human terms, but then that's also going to affect GDP um, and, and disease in general. Okay, um, and then uh, and you see some hopefully uh, nascent you know uptick at the end here. Okay, so that's you know I think one of the big stories looking forward in the next decade or two is going to be what happens in, in terms of economic growth in, in sub-Saharan Africa and Africa in, in general, right? Because we've seen um, a lot happening in, in East Asia and that probably can't go on at the same rate forever, okay? But, um, you know, I think other regions, it's interesting to see, will you see something similar, okay? Um, all right, so that's, I probably said more than I should have on, on every region, but I think each region help, tells its own story, even just with one line. Okay, um, and you can connect that up to different historical and political events if you if you look close enough, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so then um, so those are just those are the regions. The other thing we can do is you know so like here you know just go back a second. So we have you know for each region we have this this line and or you can and we did that for different countries and say like what happens the whole the whole way. The other thing we can do is just look, you know look at a particular point in time in a cross section, look at a snapshot of the world across different countries and see how, what is the distribution of different countries look like? Okay. So forgetting for a second about the identity of each country and just say, what is the di distribution of countries look like in terms of GDP per capita? Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm basically always going to be talking about GDP per capita in this lecture. Okay. Um, and so we do that. Okay. And this is, uh, this is this graph is the, the the previous stuff was from um that i just made graphs of my own from the madison project this is from i think a textbook by Chimoglu, um who's the same as Chimoglu, who is one of the authors on my nations fail um so uh and basically here you can see um what, what we have is a, a distribution okay over log gdp per capita so these are um so, so because this is a log x-axis, you know, differences here, it's like, you know, going from six to seven is a factor of 10, seven to eight is a factor of 10. Okay, so these are big differences, even if they don't look huge. You know, this between six and eight is a factor of 100. Okay, so, um, but but if you do that, okay, and these are smoothed out too, but, but these distributions, you know, you can see basically in 1820, not as much variance, okay, here going on uh, or at a relatively low level, okay. Um, Right, so that's consistent with sort of like, not a lot of growth has happened. Countries are pretty similar in a lot of ways. Okay, and maybe a little bit of a set of countries here 
probably in Western Europe, that are looking to start making a breakaway, right? As you go to 1913, then that breakaway kind of starts happening. You see two distinct peaks, right, going on here. And as you go to 2000, those peaks sort of separate even further. And there's a there's just a more general sort of broadening of this distribution. Okay, so um, that's basically the in distributional and pictorial terms, what I was saying about you know, a lot of growth that's uneven, which induces a lot of variance as you move forward. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and the only thing which I note up at the top that to keep in mind about these graphs is that they are, uh, these are distributions over countries. Okay. But it's not people, right? So in a perfect world, if we had perfect data, what we'd really want to know is if, if we only cared about just like people and we didn't necessarily care about what country they live in, where they happen to be, have been born in most cases. Um, and we just like, what's the distribution of income or well being uh, uh, over all people in the world? That, well, that's what you would want. Okay. Right. But, but what we have here is countries. Okay. So that means in particular that a country is just represented as like, you know, the U S has a GDP per capita of 60,000, right? They're just a point at 60,000, right? They're not like a whole distribution of all 330 million people in the U S with their incomes. Okay. So, uh, because we know that there's a lot of variance there too. Okay. So this is hiding some of the variance within country, but it's kind of the best we have because we don't have that data over time for, for every person. Okay. Um, okay, so then the, the next thing we can do is, so this is like pretty far back. This is as far back as the Madison data goes until 1820. The next thing we can do is, is look a little bit, just zoom in on the more recent era. Okay, because this, the previous one, the last one was 2000. Now we're going to zoom in on 2000 and basically go from 1960, 1980, 2000. Okay, so here you can see there's less changes. I was just we're looking over a short, shorter period of time. Okay, but, um, and I think the story here is like, you um you still have uh kind of two not two peaks really but two arms or shoulders or whatever uh on the left and the right but then there's like a group of countries that basically moves from the left here over more towards the right okay and since, since 1960 and basically that's going to be a lot of that is east asian countries Okay, so Middle Eastern countries as well. Okay, uh, moving from sort of the the relatively poorer to the relatively richer. Okay, and they they don't go all the way, but they they go some distance there. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, okay. So, so so those distributions we looked at. Okay, those were just saying at a given point in time. Cut the data and and look at the distribution of GDP per capita. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, it might be in, in principle, it could be that there were, you know, just certain countries were rich in 1820 and, uh, or, or in this case, let's say 1960 or something like that. Um, and then you go to 2000 and other countries are rich, but they're different countries. Okay. But like, we kind of know that that's not the case, right? So we know that these things are very persistent. Okay. And, and you can easily verify that and, and see it pictorially in the data see that the countries that were rich in 1960 are by and large also the countries that were rich in 2000 and vice versa okay so um but but i guess here we can get an idea of like how true that is like, we know that it's kind of basically true but like you know how, how often are there exceptions to that how much sort of variance around that story is there okay so so we can do that all right and so what we're doing here is um so this is sort of like a scatter plot okay so on the x-axis here, we have log GDP per capita relative to the U.S. Okay, so this is like their ranking relative, not the ranking relative, but actually the, you know, take their GDP per capita, divide by the value for the U.S. in, say, 1960. Take the log of that just to, because these are exponentials. These, th these things are growing exponentially. Take the log of that. Um, and that's what we have here. So, like, the U.S. is by definition at one, and then different countries are... Are lower okay and then do the same thing but for 2000 okay so again the us is by definition at one so the us is always by the construction of this graph at the the one one point up at the top right and then other countries are, are farther further down okay so it, it could be that there are countries that are above one that have higher gdp than the us it's just that the us has a pretty high gdp per capita okay so um so it, it, this data they they appear to be the highest i think so I think like Luxembourg does have higher GDP per capita than the U.S., right? So some small countries that are like really rich have higher GDP, but um, for the most part, they don't. I guess Luxembourg's not in this data. 
Okay, so then, um, well, what can you see? Well, first of all, there, there's a positive relationship here, okay? And it's kind of close to one-to-one, -one, right? So so that's saying that, you know, if you're uh, the Philippines, okay, relative to the U.S., PH, that's PHL. That's not that's not Philly, Philly hockey. No, that's that's uh, the Philippines. Um, uh, relative to the uh, uh, U.S., you're at around 0.2, okay? And then if you go to 2000, actually, you're, you're less, you're probably more like, 0.15 or something like that okay so um but then like uh yeah so i guess um how should i say this uh if this line were a 45 degree line that like like sorry this dashed line is like the regression line this is the best fit regression line this is like the the, the mean okay if, if this line were a 45 degree line that would mean if you're 0.2 in 1960 then you're you're 0.2 in um uh in 2000 Okay, so, and I think that's basically approximately true. This is almost forty-five degrees. Okay, so, um, yeah, but 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 I guess the interesting thing is, for the most part, that's the story. Is that where you were in nineteen sixty relative to the U.S. is where you are in two thousand? Okay, it's not like if if all countries in the world converged in some great sort of equal equal utopia, not utopia, but like at least things were equal. You know, wherever you started in nineteen sixty on the X position you'd be at one in 2000, you'd, you'd just converge to the US. And so everyone would be like up here, right? But the fact that we haven't converged means that there's gonna be, you're gonna be down here. Okay, so you're gonna, your, your history is gonna be persistent. Okay, so you can see, um, so these are three digit ISO codes for countries. So some of them are kind of clear. So Philippines, uh, Botswana, Taiwan, Argentina, ARG, um, Nepal, NPL, a lot of them are kind of obvious, but you know, some, some of them aren't really. Um, Spain is less obvious unless you speak Spanish, uh, ESP, um, Ethiopia, and so on. Okay, so um, you can see that's the main story. And then the, the exceptions, I guess, are, are interesting. I mean, it, it probably not so surprising. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, right? So those are the, the rapidly growing East Asian uh, or in some cases Southeast Asian countries. Um, Botswana is one that maybe less people are aware of who's is doing really, like they weren't doing very well before, but they had a really rapid amount of growth and now they're doing actually quite well. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there are exceptions of course. Okay. And those are interesting, but, but the, the trend is, is persistence of your relative position in, in terms of GDP. Okay. Um, the other thing you do with th this graph is basically conveying the same information, which is instead of looking at where you are in, at in 1960 and where you are in 2000 it's saying okay what look at where you are in 1960 and then just look at your average growth rate um <clears throat> uh between 1960 and 2000 okay so it's the same information it's just like a different way of visualizing it and so and, and but, but i guess here essentially what you can see is that you know regardless of where you i mean like where you are in 1960 doesn't really affect your your growth rate going to 2000 okay so, so if you had a lot of convergence, you'd see a lot of countries up here with that, if they had low levels of GDP, they'd have rapid growth to converge to that frontier, like, like, uh, Taiwan, Korea, and Hong Kong, and Singapore, and Botswana. Um, but you don't see all the countries up here. In fact, you see a ton of countries kind of everywhere, right? Um, so, so yeah, that's lack of convergence. Okay. That just means that these countries aren't necessarily rapidly catching up. But the other cool thing I guess you can see here, which you couldn't see in the previous graph as much, is also that the variance changes, in case it's getting into discussing the variance of GDP growth, but not over time, but across countries, okay? The countries with lower relative GDP also have a higher variance, is that some of them do really well and some of them do like really not that well, okay? So like, I guess it's Nicaragua, I think it's Zaire, um, and so on. So you see a lot of variation here because probably these countries are going to also have a lot of political instability. And so that's going to just add in another source of variance. Okay. Um, and as you go farther out, well, there's, there's also fewer countries, but, but I think there's also less variance uh, over here in these, these relatively higher income countries. Okay. And that's not surprising. Right. I mean, I think, I think it's consistent with what we would expect. Right. Um, okay. And then I think this is the last, this, well, this is the last distributional slide we're going to look at. Um, so, so like, okay, so we didn't find convergence. Okay. So 
you know, the, the across looking across the world, the, these countries just uh, didn't converge. Um, you can, if you really look hard enough, you can find it. Okay, but you have to like basically kind of cheat a little bit and look at a select group of countries. Okay, so and, and I guess the idea is that um, maybe there's convergence. At least, like if you're relatively rich, maybe there's some convergence there. Okay, uh, such that you don't have to worry about, as much about political instability. So if you look at um, OECD countries, so OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's like one of those, it's, I mean, it's not the UN, but it's like an international organization where countries work together and do stuff. Um, for us, also, they pro for economists, they provide data. Um, and it's mostly Western European countries, all right, um, with the addition of European offshoots, like New Zealand, Australia, US, um, and Japan also kind of randomly. Um, and I think maybe Turkey, although they might not be in here. Um, so, but but uh, that's that's the OECD. If you look at these countries, um, and you plot the relative levels, so this is actually the log relative level here, and then look at their growth. So it's kind of the same, it's the same basic thing uh, that we looked at in the previous graph. Well, see here you do see uh, a convergence story that the lower your relative income in the beginning in 1960, the higher your growth is going to be. So like a Greece or a Japan or Portugal to some extent, uh, low relative um, income in 1960, but then uh, the growth rate is, you know, four or five, six percent per year, which is much better than the U.S., right? Um, and if you look at these richer countries, so uh, Canada, U.S., CH is Switzerland, that's a uh helvetican confederation or something like that um if you look at them they have a roughly two percent growth rate right they, they they kind of were already at the frontier and they just have a regular two percent growth rate all right um so that's that's what convergence looks like in in this type of graph all right uh if you if you go forward actually farther than in the 1980 to 2000 so i actually split this up in 60 to 80 then 80 to 2000 if you do it again in 80 to 2000 we don't see that much because essentially these countries have already converged. Okay, so the convergence happened in like the 60 to 80 zone. 80 to 2000, they're kind of already in the same pack and it's just like, it's just going to be noise at that point. Okay. Um, and, the, and, the, and at that point, where they are is more particular to what was up in that country, right? So Greece and, and I guess Switzerland for some reason uh, had various issues, political instability in the case of Greece, I think. Um, whereas Ireland, uh, they, I guess they were I don't know. They they've been doing well. For, I, I don't know exactly why. I guess um, they've been picking up high high tech industries and things like that. Okay. Um, I guess maybe the troubles might have abated, so they they had a little bit of more more stuff to to do. Um, yeah. So so if you if you do this selection, which is kind of cheating, then you can you can see convergence. But if you look overall, you don't really see it. Okay. Um, okay. So that that's kind of uh, tour of the data. All right. Um, I guess that took up an hour of lecture, which is surprising, but I guess I'm, I'm good at rambling on. Um, so I'll give you, an, so, so I, I do want to, you know, provide nuance to how we talk about GDP. You know, it's just, it's a measure and a measure is particular, it measures economic activity, but it's also kind of flawed in a lot of ways. And it's, doesn't cover the entirety of human existence and happiness and welfare and all that. Okay. Um, so, so, and so there's a bunch of different, you know, critiques and issues with GDP. Okay. So one being that is economic activity, therefore, uh, but, but it doesn't say that it's economic activity that's necessarily useful. Okay. So it's like the, if you heard of like the, you know, like a, uh, if you, if you just, for some reason, people are doing useless things and paying for it. Okay, I mean, honestly, when I said that out loud, the first thing I thought of was <clears throat> was NFTs. But um, you know, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, that's just a more modern example. But if you, if you're digging holes and paying people to dig holes and paying people to fill them back in for no reason, that would show up as GDP, but it wouldn't really be that useful. Okay, so in principle, there's nothing saying that GDP has to relate to welfare and useful things being done. Okay, but of course. A lot of, well, okay, Pe people don't generally do things for no reason, right? So people generally are optimizing. They're trying to maximize at least their own well-being, if not societies. Okay, so what we're relying on is the idea that people aren't going to be wasting tons of money for no reason, 
okay, that's that's kind of implicit in saying that GDP represents something about well-being and welfare. Okay, so that that's one assumption, which is, I think, often true, but it's not always going to be true. And like, especially if you start looking at it too closely, you know, you might potentially deceive yourself if, if things are changing underneath you. Okay, so that's one issue. Um, the other issue is just that like it doesn't cover everything. So like when I was talking about the the GDP differential that's basically persistent between um, Western Europe and the U.S., um, you know, uh, part of that was uh, you know I, I I told that story about you know you, you work a little bit less, you have less GDP, but you have more leisure time, right? So the idea there is you know you, if you really want to think about welfare, you should think about some combination of your your income, your consumption, your material well being, and your you know your free time. And, and just enjoying yourself when you're not working, right? Um, or when you are working, right? Working conditions. Um, and so that, those are going to be important for welfare, okay? But those aren't necessarily included in, in, uh, in GDP, okay? So that's why that this paper that we're going to do by Jones called Beyond GDP, it's, um, it's I, I think it's really good, you know, because it, it adds in, basically it says, okay, th let's think about things from a utility perspective, okay? So like when we do... A more advanced econ, you know, you think about different agents with utility functions, um, and they make choices based on these utility functions. Okay, here is say you have some utility function. We're going to kind of like aggregate that to a societal level by having a bunch of people with their own utility functions and and their own levels of consumption and leisure time and health and all of that, and aggregate that into some general metric of welfare. Okay, so we're expanding the scope of things that we look at beyond just material consumption to to try and construct a better measure of welfare. Okay. And that, that's what Beyond GDP does. Okay. And so, um, yeah. And so it's great. I mean, you, you, you can think of a million different things to put in there, right? They, they end up putting in basically, <clears throat> well, you know, consumption as, as proxy by GDP, uh, uh, leisure time, health, which is like life expectancy when they measure it, um, and, uh, inequality basically. Okay. So, um, and so the reason they don't put in more is just like, well, if you want to include it and construct this metric, you need to actually have data on it. So that kind of constrains still what you can do. Oops, sorry, there's a chat. Um, you happen to know when Saturday of Living started being recorded? Michael. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I guess, I mean, I guess it's like um, in terms of people measuring GDP and thinking about GDP as a metric. So, so I don't know about like, you know, like standard of living that's uh I, I don't know exactly but like in terms of like gdp and, and think about that as a, as a standard of living for a country um i don't know i mean uh i should know that probably i'll look it up i'll look it up and tell you guys next time but i can tell i mean i can tell you that the part partial answer here is um you know like if you look at the pen so the pen world tables does you know aggregates gdp information from statistical organizations in different countries and that basically starts in 1950 okay so i'm assuming uh, i'm assuming the pen world tables scoured the world far and wide to try and find this data and that the best they could do is 1950 and onward so probably it's somewhere around 1950 okay um and in some sense that's not so surprising because um it's just that era i mean uh you know, and partially because of the the World War, World War Two, I mean, uh, there were just tons of changes in like administrations, like even like administering, like the, the Department of Defense and everything like that in the U.S. For instance, is a, as the war ramped up, it's a massive undertaking. And you need record keeping, and you also have computers coming on, uh, like at least like like big mainframe computers that are capable of tabulating all of this. So so it's it maybe it's not surprising that 1950 is around when it's when when this starts happening. Um, but I, I think that's basically it. But in terms of the conceptual idea as GDP, I, I don't actually know. Uh, but I'll, I'll look that up and and I'll tell you guys next class. But that's that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So so yeah. So that's the that's the beyond GDP. Okay, so we're going to address that. All right. Um, so there's basically like people doing pointless stuff, just not including relevant information for actual welfare. Um, and then I guess the other thing is, is, is inability to measure it. So like I talked about the issue of you own your own house. And so you, you don't show up as like an economic transaction, even though you are enjoying your own house. 
right? And that should be counted. Um, like same with the car, right? So, so I, I, you know, I guess I guess really it's just like the house transaction shows up as one giant transaction in the beginning, and then those show up again. But really, you're you're not just enjoying your house the day you bought it, okay? Uh, you're enjoying it for a long time. Same same with any durable capital, anything like that. You're enjoying it over time. So that you you kind of just want to amortize that, right? Um, but but then there's also uh, sort of like gray market, black market, informal economy stuff. So you you have economic transactions just just are not recorded. Um, part of it is just like people don't bother to record it. Some of it might be a desire to evade taxation and stuff like that. So, um, but you do have, you know, not, I mean, in the US probably yes, but it, certainly in other countries, like I know like India has a really large informal sector, right? So uh, that's just kind of how it works. Okay, so that, that's just like an inability to measure it too, but that can be important as well because if a country can't measure it, then they look bad in GDP data and that that's not 100% right, okay? Um, all right, so those are all, that's my laundry list of problems with GDP, okay? Um, yeah, so, but but I guess, you know, there's other ways to think about just like kind of sort of visualizing statistically um, GDP. So so one way I think is kind of neat um, is, is uh, because with GDP, it's like, there's also the, the scale question, which is also true of like any like utility or income uh, measure is like, um, is it like if you have twice as much income or GDP, are you twice as bad as well off? It's like I don't even know what that means, right? But um, yeah. So so that scaling problem, right? Uh, what does it really mean? Is is also an issue that that's, you can't really get around. Okay, but um, you can you can try and think of different ways to 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 kind of think about it. Um, so one way, which is is we, we can do here, which we will do here, uh, is. To kind of you know, we use the U.S. as kind of a benchmark. It's it's kind of U.S. centric, which I think is an issue generally in economics, especially. Uh, but we use the U.S. as a benchmark. So so one thing you can do is um, <clears throat> map other countries' like current experience into like what year was the U.S. Did the U.S. look similar to that in terms of GDP? Okay, so if you got a country like um, say the Philippines today, which has about half the GDP of the U.S. I think. Oh no, we we just we already looked at the data. It's like it's like twenty percent, but that was in two thousand. So I don't know, but it's some fraction of uh, some percentage of the U.S. Right? Uh, you go back in time in the U.S. and look at where where the U.S. have that level of GDP, and assign that year to the Philippines this year. Okay, so you can do this for every country in every particular year. You can say this country in this year when what year did the U.S. look like that? Okay, so for so you're mapping from like uh, semi abstract GDP numbers into years in the US. Okay. And then that's like a transformation of your data and you can plot that transform data for a particular country. Okay. So, um, or for a bunch of countries. Okay. I forgot about this. Um, so here what we do is, is I'm looking, uh, in the current, in, in 2020, which is when the, this data is, is, uh, the most recent year, um, look at, you know, for every country in 2020, look at their GDP and look at when, the, what year the U S had that GDP. Okay, so you get a bunch of years for every country. So the Philippines, you get like 1960. For Japan, you get like, I will see in a second, but I think you get like 1990 or something like that. So you get a bunch of years and you can look at the distribution. Okay, so according to this, and I, I, I don't, again, because I think GDP is certain plots. I mean, the, the, what this is saying is that there are countries basically that if you just look at the GDP levels, that they're the same as you would see in the US in like 1800 or 1900. And then a lot of, you know, there's two peaks here, but then a lot of them are around 1950. Okay. And some of them are more 2000. I mean, the best you can do, at least because the U S has a pretty high GP is, is get 2020. So the U S has 2020 by definition. Uh, yeah. And the worst, well, the worst you can do is, is 1750 because that's as far back as the U S data goes. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, th so you can look at this distribution, Okay, so I mean, it's just a transformation of the GDP data, but I think it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and then the other thing you can do is instead of looking at a distribution over uh, across countries at a given time, you know, you can look at the other dimension, uh, look at a single country across time. Okay, uh, and here I'm choosing Japan. Okay, so um, let's see. So so remember it, it, when we're looking across time. Okay, so in this world, I was looking across time. The U.S. their like GDP year is like that current year by definition. So 
you know, in 1920, the U.S. had the GDP of the U.S. in 1920. That's tautological. Um, so this dotted line here is just the identity line where, where the year 1880 equals 1880. 2020 equals 2020. This is the U.S. basically. It's the reference point. Uh, now here in blue is Japan. Okay, so we're saying, uh, well, here it basically the, the, it's it's sort of cut off because we don't have data sorry, before 1800. Um, so this is kind of we don't we don't know, but it's less than 1800. Now here you can see like in 1920 Japan had the the level that the U.S. had in 1830. Okay, so they're still like a hundred years behind the U.S. in some sense. You can see World War II just devastated them at least after the run up. Okay, um, then they had this rapid recovery. So they basically go from roughly 1880 U.S. equivalent to, uh, you know, 1940 U.S. equivalent really quickly. Okay, and they almost catch up with the U.S. Uh, by the 70s, 80s, and then they kind of taper off a little bit as they fall relatively. They, they're still growing slowly, but they're falling behind the U.S. in a relative sense. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and this is starting in 1868. So that's like the Meiji Restoration when um, Japan... Kind of, I don't know. They decided basically that they really wanted to adopt foreign technology and and customs, and uh, they did pretty aggressively. Okay, I mean, I think the technology component is is the most important one here. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, it tells a similar story to what you would see looking at a GDP graph, but maybe it it provides a way to concretely think about it a little bit more by by giving it a year. Okay, um, but yeah. All right, so then, um, oh, math. All right, so so that's it for uh, the the historical stuff. Okay, so I basically have five minutes here, so I'll just give you a little preview of what we're going to do next time. All right. Um, <clears throat> my yeah, my uh, lecturing. Sometimes when I'm lecturing, I'll I'll, I'll do the like if you, if you know these like low budget animes, they'll like spend the last ten minutes talking about what happens in the next episode and the first ten minutes of the next episode talking about the last episode. So. Um, you know, sometimes I do that. So here uh, in the next episode or lecture, as it were, um, we're going to talk about uh, more math. Okay. We're going to, we're going to try and model this. Um, uh, we're going to try and model the pre-modern era. Okay. So that before the industrial revolution, that whole period of stagnation. Okay. We're going to come up with a model of that. Okay. So, so, I mean, one model of that is just nothing happened and nothing changed. So it's pretty easy to model that, right? But um, we, we do know that, you know, population changed over that time. Okay, the technology was changing some over that time as well, but the standard of living really wasn't changing that much. Okay, so then the question is, you have these things changing in the background, okay? But like in terms of the final outcome that we kind of care about, the standard of living, not much, okay? So so the question is why, all right? And so, so Malthus, old Tommy Malthus, Thomas Malthus, um, he had an idea, um, which, which is, which kind of relates to, uh, I mean, it relates to population. So basically like the standard of living influences population growth, population and growth influences the standard of living. And I'll be more concrete as I go on, uh, the next lecture. And there's some dynamic wherein you can have, you know, some population growth, but then eventually the standard of living stagnates and actually the population kind of maxes out at some point. Okay. So it, it's kind of, you know, it kind of relates to returns to scale and, and things like that. Okay. So um, now the, the interesting thing about Malthus is like, well, I, I don't think Malthus is 100% correct. Okay. I, I think he was wrong in a lot of ways. Um, but but he had a decent theory of why there was stagnation and around like 1800. And like the second he came up with that theory, it, it actually in a forward looking sense was wrong. Because then all of a sudden there was this huge industrial revolution and a massive amount of growth. Okay, so he had a decent theory looking backwards, and then it was just immediately wrong. Okay, so um, you know, them's the breaks. Uh, but but I think it's interesting, and I we've we've refreshed it a little bit and and sort of phrase it in modern economic uh, terms and notation, and I think mm, improved it to make it like uh, just an interesting way to think about not just this era of stagnation, but also sort of like um, various points in time for people who would say we are, we have reached the limits of growth, right? Like we, we have too much population. We won't be able to feed people maybe, but then like there's the agricultural revolution and, and we were, and the population keeps growing and people by and large can eat, um, you know, like peak oil, all that stuff. You can also think about climate, you know, like climate 
change running out of environment, but maybe we can hopefully generate some kind of clean technology to, to keep going. Okay, so you can think about sort of these issues of scarcity and, and when you run up into these constraints uh, in similar ways. So I think it provides like a good foundation to, to think about things looking forward, okay? Um, and it's a relatively simple model, okay? That's the other good thing, all right? So um, that's it, I think I'm out of time. We'll talk about that next lecture. Um, yeah, so, uh, but have a good weekend. And um, I'm sorry, but and I won't see you on Monday because Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, right? So I'll see you one week from today uh, where we'll also talk about why nations fail. All right, thanks.